Hi, I'm Dennis Nash, and this week we'll be covering the epidemiology of HIV and AIDS. Uh, the outline of the lecture is here. We'll be covering a lot, um, including the emergence of HIV in the U.S., an overview of the clinical and epidemiological aspects of HIV and AIDS, the HIV AIDS treatment era, and a lot on HIV AIDS surveillance and how to track the HIV epidemic. And as part of that component of the lecture, we'll, we'll talk about the epidemiology of HIV in the US and we'll delve into quite a bit of detail about how HIV is tracked in New York City. Of course, all, all surveillance is local, ultimately local, and we can't track what's going on nationwide and, and unless we rely on local jurisdictions to do good surveillance. And so we'll delve into how surveillance for HIV and AIDS is done in New York City and then review some of the information that we've gleaned, we've gleaned from HIV AIDS surveillance here around you know, what, what, the, what the epidemic actually looks like in New York City and how it's evolving. And towards the end, we'll wrap up by uh, talking about the local and national so-called Ending the Epidemic initiatives. These are um, initiatives that have been launched uh, both in New York and since then nationally that are aiming to really reduce the public health threat of, of HIV to levels uh, below, which um, we, we can now uh, thankfully achieve theoretically because we have some amazing tools to help control the epidemic. And then we'll just finally briefly turn our attention uh, globally to the HIV pandemic um, and how scale up of HIV treatment in resource limited settings has been going. So HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus. It was discovered in 1983 by scientists at the Pasteur Institute in France. It's a retrovirus that was isolated from human patients with acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS and it was discovered as the causative agent about two years after the first cases of AIDS were recognized in the US. It's transmitted from person to person by the direct and indirect modalities. And this can happen through sex and needle sharing, through contamination of the blood supply, or through uh, vertical transmission. Basically, it's exposure to, to blood of infected individuals. The virus attacks the immune system directly. Um, specifically, it attacks the uh, CD4 cells in the immune system and, and thereby um, makes the host vulnerable to opportunistic illnesses uh, by, by sort of depleting the immune system or de decimating the immune system. The incubation period is about nine to 10 years after infection. So um, about nine to 10 years after infection, people go on to develop AIDS. And this makes it challenging, of course, to identify people with the infection. Um, as we've seen with other infectious diseases, when there's a long incubation period or long asymptomatic period, it makes recognition and diagnosis and disease control very challenging. So there are highly effective treatments available, though. They didn't really come um, down the pike until the mid-1990s, but they're very effective in, in extending life and also have the added benefit of reducing or even ending the infectious period when people are on treatment for, for, for life. There is no cure, but there is a, a highly effective treatment. There's no vaccine. There have been several attempts to identify, to develop, and, and um and, and identify an effective vaccine, but there have been none uh, successful to date. And most recently, there is a preventive, preventive tool called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, which is a daily pill that people at high risk for HIV can take if they're HIV negative to prevent acquisition of HIV infection. So first, where it began, um, there's a, a good place to start is, is this MMWR that came out in the early 1980s, 1981, which published a, a case series of uh, cases of pneumocystis pneumonia in, in LA that were detected. And these were unusual. They were occurring among previously healthy young men. And, and it appeared that they had very weakened immune systems. But this is the, this is the first case reports of what became what, what eventually came to be known as AIDS in the early 1980s. These are these are hand-drawn early epi, epidemic curves that were made by staff at the New York City Health Department that were used to track cases of AIDS by uh, month of symptom onset, as you can see here. They were tracking 
both national cases as well as those happening in New York City because the the outbreak of this unusual cluster of of disease was New York City was was an epicenter here and uh, they were also tracking the different ways that this unusual disease was presenting both in terms of the pneumocystis carinii pneumonia which i mentioned that was reported in the MMWR but also a rare cancer called Kaposi sarcoma or KS. And sometimes these, these opportunistic illnesses, as they were called, or OIs, could, could present simultaneously. And here you're seeing another epidemic curve, but it's really showing deaths among people diagnosed with AIDS. And some of the early cases, so some of the early cases here are reported, um, seen here stratified by sex. You, you may... No, if you've read the book or if you've seen the the movie and the band played played on, there was a lot of focus on this on the emergence of of AIDS as a gay disease and one that affected primarily gay men. But in fact, there was some pretty early epidemiological evidence and surveillance evidence suggesting that this was something that was affecting both men and women from very early on in the epidemic and the emergence of the epidemic. And here, again, showing some of the early epidemiology um, here, breaking, breaking information out by race, ethnicity, by opportunistic illness. And as you can see here, reports of AIDS among people who were, who, who were heterosexuals as opposed to men who have sex with men, which was the initial focus of the CDC investigation. So it was... This, this is a map that just shows the, some of the early cases that of, of AIDS that were presenting in, in February of 1983. And you can see that the yellow dots sort of showing up in a few places on the map, most notably New York and um, California, but also a few other places around the country. And so it was really important to, to institute surveillance for AIDS to understand really the extent to which the, this this phenomenon, this 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 disease that was appeared to be growing um, in terms of the number of cases. What was the extent of the geographic extent of it? How many people were affected? What does the epidemiology look like? But before we jump into the surveillance part, I do just want to say a, a little bit about what we've since learned about. You know, where did HIV come from? So where did it come from? Like a lot of pandemics. HIV resulted from zoonotic transmission to, to humans. Um, HIV crossed from chimpanzees to humans. Actually, the estimates go back to the 1920s, and it, and it appeared to have, have occurred in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. It was probably the result of chimpanzees carrying um, a virus called simian immunodeficiency virus, virus or SIV, which is closely related to HIV, and, and it could have gone gotten into humans as a result of you know, these chimpanzees being hunted and eaten by, by people living in the area. Since then, some phylogenetic analyses have uh, suggested that the, the viral genome, based looking at analyses of the viral genome from the 1970s and early 80s, it, it appears that HIV made its way um, to the U.S. from the DRC, but first by way of Haiti, and then and then from there to New York sometime in the early 1970s, and ultimately to other parts of the U.S. You know, la later on in, in the 70s. This also matches up with, with what we know about the natural history of HIV, uh, the incubation period uh, or the time from infection to onset of AIDS is about nine to 10 years. And so the the first AIDS cases began to appear as early as 1978 in the U.S. So if you assume a nine to 10 year incubation period, it suggests that transmission could have occurred in the U.S. as, as early as 1968. So back to surveillance, why is it important? Of course, we need to be able to initially monitor and characterize the epidemic. Initially, it was really just tracking AIDS cases and not HIV without AIDS, as as you may know, HIV begins as an infect a viral infection that you know takes quite a long time to progress for people to present with any disease, and the disease is is an immunodeficiency um, 
disease. So it takes about nine to 10 years on average for, for that to occur after infection. So initially, when it was really poorly understood what was going on, or even whether it was a virus um, that was causing the cases, it became very important to do to expand to develop a case definition and to to conduct surveillance for AIDS. Later on, once it was a little bit more understood uh, what was causing what the cause of the epidemic was, it became more important to have surveillance that could help understand and detect changes in patterns of transmission. And eventually, uh, when treatment and uh, other services became available, surveillance could be used to help target those and evaluate, you know, guide the development and evaluate the impact of interventions and, and ultimately to provide data that uh, funding decisions could be used, such as how, how, to, how to allocate federal funding across the U.S. Because as you'll see, the HIV epidemic does differentially affect uh, citizens by uh, geography. So initially then it was a clinical case definition um, that was developed for tracking AIDS. There was no, uh, it was not clear initially early on whether it was a virus, so there was no laboratory test available. And it was really a clinical case definition that was based on the diagnosis of, of one uh, or more of 23 specific opportunistic illnesses. We, we talked about some of the early ones, pneumocystis crenia and pneumonia and Kaposi sarcoma, sarcoma, but there were uh, several others that could fall into the category of AIDS-defining illness. By 1985, there was a widely available serologic test. Once it was discovered that, H, that, that the cause of AIDS was a virus deemed or named human immunodeficiency virus for HIV, a serologic test was, was developed and that could be added to the case definition. And so you could have people with the clinical syndrome and then also confirmed with a laboratory diagnosis, which greatly helps with surveillance. And eventually it was expanded to include in 1993 to include some additional opportunistic illnesses that were found to be associated with AIDS and also added a, a criteria for CD4 counts below 200. So even if you didn't have a di an opportunistic illness, if your CD4 uh, levels dropped below 200, uh, that would classify you as an AIDS case as well. And this was tracked through a combination of active surveillance provider reporting and then beginning in, in uh, 1993 lab reporting as well. So just going back to the map here, again, advance, advancing a little bit forward in time, as of 1985, um, there were about 10,000 cases around the U.S. You can see, you can see the a number of dots in, in more places than before, and, and I'm just going to zip through a few years at a time here so you can get a sense of how the, the epidemic spread by 1989, 100,000 cases around the U.S. And by... By, by uh, 1995, 500,000 cases, much more, much more uh, in the way of, of geographic spread. And, and finally, by 1997, there were about 626,000 case, AIDS cases that had been diagnosed around the U.S. And by 2003, there were estimated to be about a million, uh, a million cases of, of AIDS in the U.S., in the process of, of conducting surveillance and also epidemiological studies, we learned a lot about the, the ways that which the ways which HIV could be transmitted beyond what was initially thought to be uh, you know limited to sex between men. It became clear that it was also transmitted by heterosexual sex, um, needle sharing, and injection drug drug use. And, and uh, even to a, a lesser degree with risk, but non-zero oral sex. And also early on, there were well-documented cases of HIV being transmitted by blood transfusion. And so the, once a lab test was available, it was possible to actually screen and, and uh, increase the safety of the blood supply from HIV transmission, but very high risk associated with 
blood transfusion with, the, with the blood that was contaminated with HIV, and also um, mother-to-child transmission. About 25% of the time, if, if a woman, a pregnant woman is infected with HIV, about 25% of the time, her, her newborn will also be infected with HIV. So through, through surveillance and through observational cohort studies uh, and research that was aiming to understand the, the different modes of transmission and risk factors, and also to sort of quantify uh, the risk associated with them. We, we've, we've since learned a great deal about the ways in which HIV can be uh, transmitted. A little bit about the life cycle of, of this virus. Uh, HIV attacks cells in the immune system, specifically the CD4 cells. As you can see, the red uh, circle sp sphere here represents the HIV virus and its genetic material RNA inside. It enters through CD4 receptors in, into the cells, the CD4 cells of the immune system, um, and its RNA makes its way into the um, membrane of the, of the in, into the membrane of the CD4 cell nucle nucleus here, and that RNA virus is incorporated in to the machinery of the cell itself and the virus begins replicating within the CD4 cells. And the, uh, the virus can replicate so um, pro prolifically that the, the are, there are so many cop copies of the virus within the CD4 cell that it, it kills the CD4 cells and it bursts and, and copies of the virus get released and can infect other cells. And so at the same time, the virus replicates and spreads, it also destroys the immune system. And, and this is why we see the, uh, these very pronounced opportunistic illnesses that are re really unusual to see in people, except for those with you know, severely compromised immune systems. So understanding the life cycle, of course, is, is really important for understanding the, the natural history of HIV infection, which in turn is very helpful and important for uh, epidemiology and surveillance. Although a lot, a lot was learned about the epidemiology of HIV before understanding you know, that, that it was a virus and, and, and it's, its life cycle and things like that. So, but also understanding the life cycle is critical for basic scientists who are, are, are focused on developing treatments and vaccines and things like that. So this is a slide that just shows the, uh, like a schematic of the natural history of HIV. I believe this was some of the early work of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's a household name these days. Um, much of his early work, or much of the early work on HIV was led by, by Dr. Fauci as well. And the schematic here that, that comes from their early work shows that when HIV infection occurs, this is, this is showing the level of CD4 cells. So a person without HIV infection may have, you know, upwards of a thousand CD4 cells uh, per, per cubic millimeter on average. But then when infection occurs, um, showing here on the red line, the, the number, the copies of the virus, um, the virus begins to replicate and, and increases. And, and that produces a initial sort of rapid decline in CD4 cells. Initially, the, the CD4 cells in the immune system appear to gain control over the virus. And so you see a decline in the amount of virus circulating, somewhat of a recovery, but not full recovery of the CD4 cells. But, but over time, the virus continues to replicate and the CD4 cells um, continue to decline and ultimately can be you know, really quite depleted. And after a period of about you know, eight or nine years, the CD4 cells get below that, that threshold of 200 that I mentioned. And this is when the, the risk for opportunistic illnesses can begin to increase and when symptoms can begin to show. And with time, without any treatment, this will progress to, to death. And I also want to say that this, this, this represents from an epidemiological standpoint, you know, one of those big challenges in the control of infectious diseases, there's a very long asymptomatic period here um, in people with HIV. So people can be going for years and years without showing any symptoms or knowing that they may have the virus. And that makes it very challenging to identify those who may be infected, diagnose them and treat them, but also inform people about ways that they, they should change their behavior so that they can prevent onward spread to, to others.
So these long asymptomatic periods, such as we've seen with HIV and, and other infectious diseases, really present some, some significant challenges to control of, of these infectious diseases. Over time, scientists began to, to test some different treatments, and there was one very early one called AZT, which was, was tried in people with HIV to sort of present, pre prevent disease progression. And you can see on this slide here, there was a slight slowing of disease progression. They looked at a number of different outcomes. AZT did appear to, to slow disease progression a, a little bit. Uh, then they began to try different combinations of, of drugs, so two drugs at a time, AZT plus another therapy. And you can see one of the first trials here, this one was led by um, Scott Hammer at Columbia as part of the, you know, for, for the larger AIDS clinical trials group. And, and including the, the AZT plus a second drug really did improve the proportion that, were, that did not have a decline in CD4 count over time or develop AIDS or develop or go on to, to die. So there, these were really some promising developments in the area of treatment for HIV, treatment for a disease, an infection that was uh, pretty much deadly, very deadly. Uh, some of the outcomes here, you can see this was looking at the change in CD4 count over time. For those that only got AZT, you can see they had a bit of a improvement in CD4 count, but over time it began to continue to decline. But those um, that were in the, in the other groups seemed to fare a bit better in terms of their CD4 count decline over time. But still, it was not something that you know, continued to increase CD4 count you know, progressively and, and moving it back to where it was prior to infection. This was still looked like a virus was outsmarting some of these treatments. And I should say that the, uh, the different treatments that were developed and tested as part of these early trial, trials were targeting different parts of the HIV life cycle that we saw on, on the earlier slide. So they're, they're focused in, in, in different places. And ultimately, a third drug was added and tried in another trial in so-called uh, triple therapy or a highly active antiretroviral therapy was, was tested in a clinical trial. And this showed the results that many were really looking for. So long-term suppression of the, the virus, lowering the viral load to a very low level, not just an improvement in CD4, but sustained improvement over time and continue to um, increase as time went on compared to the control group. And of course, the proportion of people surviving over time that, that did not go on to develop AIDS was, was lower in the treatment group. So it really did slow disease progression. And this in the mid nineties really um, ushered in the, the so-called treatment era for HIV. And so effective treatment was for HIV was, was proven to prolong life, to delay progression to AIDS, induce some of the, you know, the very challenging and difficult outcomes associated with HIV, like hospitalization, frequent hospitalizations and opportunistic illnesses, drug resistance, and and raise the possibility that controlling HIV or treating someone with HIV to reduce the amount of virus that they had circulated in their blood could reduce the spread of HIV, the risk of spread of HIV from an infected person to an uninfected person. I'll come back to that. So what do the population-based data tell us about the impact of HIV in the U.S. after it emerged in the 1980s? It was really quite, you know, quite impactful. Eventually, among, among people aged 25 to 44 years, HIV became the leading cause of death for a while until the treatment era ushered in. But you can see, you know, fairly rapid increase um, compared to, to the other leading causes of death in this age group. And since then... Uh, as treatment became more widely available, the death rate dropped substantially and has continued to, you know, to decline, although it's taken quite a while to, to get it down to levels that really are, have been theoretically achievable given the effectiveness of, of the drugs. This became a question of not whether the drugs were effective enough, but whether or not it was possible to get them to everyone who needed them um, at, at scale. So, so 
Some of the vital statistics data really showed the impact of HIV on the, the death rate. It was the number one cause of death for a few years in younger age groups. And this is a map just showing the, the rates of diagnosed HIV infection. So this is prevalence of diagnosed HIV infection. As of the end of 2017, it was estimated that there were about a million people living with HIV in the U.S. And if you were to calculate a rate, actually a million people diagnosed and living with HIV. This is important because a substantial proportion of people with HIV are, are not diagnosed. And we'll come back to that in a second. But from surveillance data, the number of diagnosed HIV cases as of tw end of 2017 was about a million for a rate of about 369 per 100,000 or about 0.37% of the U.S. population. And you can get a sense from this um, map here that it is highly variable depending on you know, what part of the U.S. you're looking at. So you know, New York, but the coasts are, are very very highly affected. And this, this happened very early on in the epidemic. And increasingly, the, the southern U.S. has been much more hard hit than other states around the U.S. This is a map that shows the, the, the issue I alluded to a minute ago. What proportion of those million, what proportion of people with HIV are diagnosed and know that they have it? And you can see this also varies by state. But all across the U.S., about 86% of people living with HIV have been diagnosed. So about 14% of people with HIV around the U.S. Have, are, are infected but don't necessarily know it yet. And this proportion also varies a lot by state. As you can imagine, you know, the, the more people that, that the greater proportion of people who have HIV who are aware of their infection, the more you could do, you know, ha have effective control measures and improve access to treatment and things like that. And in places like New York, uh, which is doing very well, uh, over 90% of people, it's estimated that um, here about over 91% of people with HIV are aware of their infection. But it can really be quite low in some other other areas. For example, you know, less than 5% in some areas of the South. But when you sort of adjust for this level of, of undiagnosed HIV, you can then begin to estimate the true number of people living with HIV, not just those diagnosed. And it's just it's almost 1.2 million as of the end of 2018. And uh, you can also come up with prevalence estimates to give you a sense of the numbers of people and how it really varies from state to state. And now this is looking not at prevalence, uh, but at the number of new diagnoses per year. And this is the for the year 2018. So in 2018, uh, an estimated 37,700 41 people were diagnosed with HIV around the U.S. And this is more, it's not quite new infections or incidents. It's more like new diagnoses. People diagnosed with HIV in 2018 could have been infected in 2018, but they also could have been infected, you know, years earlier. So, so this is just reflecting the number of people with newly diagnosed HIV. And you can see how it really also varies uh, across the U.S., but you know, more diagnoses are happening in the South and in the Northeast as when you consider the, uh, the number of people in the population. So the rate, diagnosis rate per 100,000 population. So taking some of this, these data, these surveillance data on diagnoses of HIV infection, these are HIV infection, not, not, not just AIDS anymore. You can see that, you know, pretty much from you know 2010 forward, this is uh, the the surveillance data show a, a much higher rate of diagnosis of HIV among males compared with females, and that really hasn't changed much over time. You can see there have been some shifts in in age groups, but pretty much consistently over the last 10 years, those age 25 to 34 years are having the highest rate of, of new HIV diagnoses. And we've been seeing some declines um, in those aged 35 to 44 years, as well as those aged 45 to 54 years. Looking at the diagnosis rate by race ethnicity, you can see consistently from 2010, Black or African Americans have had made up the, the largest proportion of new HIV diagnoses followed by whites and Hispanics or, or Latinos. This has been you know, shifting a little bit over time as well.
and an increasing proportion of, of new HIV diagnoses are occurring among Asians. In terms of risk factor information, this is something that you can get from surveillance data and, and the predominant category of risk that is captured in surveillance is male to male sexual contact, followed by heterosexual contact, injecting drug use, which appears to account for a, a declining proportion of, of new HIV diagnoses. And then the combination of male to male sexual contact plus injecting drug use. And this is a slide that's going, it's going further back in time, first of all, to, to, uh, to, to give you, we, we were looking from 2010 forward on the previous slides, but this is now going back to 1985. But the other thing that's different here is that we're looking at the, the outcome of an AIDS diagnosis, not just HIV. And so these are severe cases of HIV, of course, uh, people that have progressed to the point of having AIDS. And you can see there's been a, a fairly substantial shift in the race, racial ethnic distribution of AIDS cases. Initially, this was predominantly white people that were affected by AIDS. And over time, this shifted and there was an increase in the proportion of AIDS cases that were Black or African American as well as those who are Latino or Hispanic and also multiple races. This represents partly an, uh, the underlying epidemiology that shifted in terms of the risk of infection, but also I mentioned the treatment era for th that does pre prevent the progression of HIV to AIDS really began around 1995 and 1996. And so some of these, these rates are also influenced by the availability of treatment and who had better access to treatment over time. And in 2017, in terms of the deaths, there were estimated to be about 16,000 deaths due to HIV in that year. And you can see, you know, not only the how the numbers break down, but also the rates. And there are major disparities in the death rates due to HIV with, you know, 17.4 per 100,000 uh, among African-Americans compared with 4.4 uh, or 2.6 among whites. So, so a many fold higher risk of death due to uh, death among people with HIV who are African-American or Black compared with other race ethnicities. And this also can give you a sense, the slide showing you uh, a sense of how, how the risk factors for HIV changed over time since the early 1980s. It was predominantly male-to-male -male sexual contact, but as I alluded to earlier, there was HIV was also uh, known to be transmitted through other modes, including injecting drug use and heterosexual sex. The, the risk factor of injecting drug use and heterosexual contacts both increased uh, and accounted for a, a greater proportion of AIDS cases over time. And that also led to a decreasing proportion of male-to-male uh, -male sexual contact as the uh, risk predominant risk factor. But since then, there has been a big decline in the number of new infections among people who inject drugs and things have begun to, you know, this has, has shifted the epidemiology and what are the, the more common modes of, of HIV transmission and progression to AIDS in this case. And it's important because because the uh, you know as you can see the the this this risk factor for male to male sexual contact primarily is a risk factor for for males and so it's really important to stratify the this risk factor distribution by gender and what you can see here is when you do that that among men it is male to male sexual contact that is you know far and away the the most common risk factor however for females it's heterosexual contact and followed with followed by injecting drug use so so the risk factor profile for for HIV is is different by gender Lastly, another really useful, um, and, and this is a, a really great success story of HIV. I mentioned the risk of transmission of HIV from pregnant women to, to, uh, to children, to, to their children. This, this is something that the HIV treatment era really had, had an impact on. And, and since 
treatment became available in the mid-90s, the number of perinatally acquired HIV cases has declined substantially. And in, I'll show you some more data later on for New York City. And it, it, it has gotten close to, to zero all around the U.S. And, and this, is, this is a major public health triumph in, 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 the, uh, in the control of HIV. So uh, let's just take a step back because it's always important to, when interpreting some of these data on infectious disease, infectious diseases and epidemiology to, to, to think about where the, the national surveillance data come from and where the data come from in general, population-based data on, on HIV. Well, as we know from the prior lectures on surveillance, you know these these data come from providers and laboratories that are they report information to local public health departments, who in turn send it to the state and then on to federal levels at the CDC. <clears throat> and I guess you know a question to sort of ask, you know, do national data that we've seen, for example, I presented you a bunch of information on the epidemiology of HIV. For the U.S., do they provide enough information for public health action at the local level? In other words, you know, can we take national trend data and sort of say, you know, this is what is likely reflecting what's happening in New York City? And of course, by now, by now, you guys know um, the answer is is definitely not. You need uh, local information, local epidemiological data to inform action at the local level because what's happening um, in one place with regard to transmission could be very different from what's happening in another place. And so we're going to delve into how New York City implemented named HIV reporting. This harks back to uh, a couple of different lectures, but we, we talked about the ethics of surveillance and named reporting in, in one of our, uh, in, as part of the surveillance lecture. We, we talked about how prior to, to HIV reporting, really only AIDS cases were reported. So only those cases, only those individuals with HIV whose infection had progressed far enough to, to put them into having immune compromised status or develop an opportunistic illness, only then would surveillance begin and those cases would be tracked. However, as we know, a large proportion of people with HIV infection can, can exist for many years without any symptoms. And, and it's important, and, and, and those symptoms may not occur for many years. So it's important to think about surveillance a little bit more upstream in the process because if you only track AIDS cases, you, you'll only have an idea of what may have been going on with, with actual transmission of the HIV, you know, some, some nine to 10 years earlier. So this is something that happened around the year 2000 in, in New York City. Um, several states and other jurisdictions had been moving towards transitioning from AIDS surveillance only to HIV plus AIDS. And this is a just a, a picture of what it looked like um, in terms of the number of AIDS cases reported by a metropolitan statistical area. New York had by far uh, the most AIDS cases of, of any other city around the U.S. And at the time, the population of New York City was about 8 million, about 36% foreign born. And based on the, the surveillance data on AIDS to date, about 50,000 or 48,416 people were, were thought to be living with HIV, sorry, living with AIDS in the city. But there was, because there wasn't surveillance for what, what happened with people with HIV before the development of AIDS, there was not any good estimate of how many people were living with HIV that, that had not progressed to AIDS, and therefore no sense of how many people were living with HIV in total around the city. So this was sort of the, the rationale for the surveillance system was that it was important to understand more about uh, the epidemiology of HIV across the entire spectrum of, of HIV infection and disease. So just in terms of the history, you know, like, like the um, rest of the country from 1982 to 1993, it was really about AIDS defining illnesses and OI diag diagnoses or opportunistic illnesses. That was really what surveillance was based on. And, you know, in 1995, the, uh, the diagnostic test, the serologic test was added as well, but it was basically done by active case surveillance 
by health departments and passive reporting by providers of new diagnoses of, of AIDS. 1993, a CD4 laboratory test was added. So, so all CD4 counts less than 200 by labs would have to be reportable. And that was combined with active surveillance and passive reporting. So now passive reporting included laboratory reporting in addition to provider reporting. And in 2000, the surveillance system was expanded greatly to include active surveillance for both HIV and AIDS with, with passive reporting by providers and labs. So um, with named HIV surveillance, you know, HIV AIDS surveillance in New York City, you know, this is what's currently purport, reportable. Any new diagnosis of HIV infection, regardless of, of, you know, whether or not the person has progressed to, to AIDS, any new diagnosis of AIDS, even if the person was previously reported as a new case of HIV without AIDS in the past, any information on known sex and needle sharing partners so that contact notification and partner notification could, could take place. And laboratories would report on positive serological tests, viral load tests, CD4 tests, and, and more recently, the results of resistance testing, which is a common practice of providers who are treating HIV patients when there's evidence that the, the patients are not responding to drugs, the concern is, is that they could have drug-resistant HIV. And so there are, are uh, genotyping tests that can be done to, uh, to look for that. And those tests are reportable as well. So since 2000, you know, many millions of, of provider and laboratory reports have, have been received by the New York City Health Department. And, and just to give you a sense of the, the universe of, what, of where active and passive surveillance occurs in New York City, or at least in, in 2000, at the time there, there were about 80 hospitals that could be reporting AIDS and HIV diagnoses, about 500 freestanding clinics, and about 2,200 private medical care providers all of whom could be diagnosing or treating people with HIV. And there were about 70 labs or so that were conducting, licensed to conduct HIV-related tests on, on New York City residents. These could be labs in New York City and New York State, but also elsewhere around the country, wherever laboratory testing might be done. So, but if, to, if a laboratory is licensed by New York State to do HIV-related tests on New York State residents, that lab would be required to report that information to the state and to the city. So just to, so, so labs and provider reports, you know, come into the health department and then they need to be sort of processed and translated from, you know, data points, uh, laboratory reports and provider reports into useful epidemiological information for surveillance. And I'm just sort of flashing up, you know, sort of the, the flow diagram, the process that has to be sort of considered when, when evaluating every piece of information that comes in relative to all pieces of information that have been received in the past on individuals, just to sort of decide, you know, is this person a new diagnosis? Is this person someone who was diagnosed previously? Have they progressed from HIV to AIDS? And, and so forth. And just, is, is, it a, is it a duplicate of someone that we've seen before? A lot of data management and data processing goes on behind the scenes in surveillance in order to, uh, you know, sort of get to this, this stage of, you know, processing all of this information. And you could sort of really call it uh, magic. It is, it is a lot of work and, and details. I go into more detail in our surveillance course about how, how this is done. But all the information that is received gets processed into epidemiological information that we can then sort of evaluate and look at sort of the trends. But in the year 2000, when the, the laboratory, when the surveillance system transitioned from only tracking AIDS cases to tracking AIDS cases as well as HIV cases that had not yet progressed to to AIDS. We learned a great deal of new information about the the epidemic, the epidemiological information. One of the first things was that we could calculate the diagnosis rates for HIV. We we would we were now tracking all diagnoses of HIV, not just those of of AIDS. So we could we could look at we, we could calculate the number the, the rate of diagnosis per hundred thousand. And as you can see here, we did this. In a given year, this is for 2001, overall about 0.75 new HIV diagnoses per 100,000 population. 
And you can see that they really, it really varied a lot by race ethnicity. This is showing the rate among black males, black females, Hispanic females, Hispanic males, Hispanic females, white males, Native American males, et cetera. And you can see that, you know, there are very big differences by race ethnicity in the rate, in the diagnosis rate of HIV in that first year, full year of, of HIV reporting in, in New York City. And then we could also calculate the, uh, estimate the prevalence of HIV. So how many people were diagnosed and living with HIV around the city? Overall, we estimated that there were about 1% of New Yorkers were diagnosed and living with HIV. But again, because surveillance captures other information about, about people diagnosed with HIV and AIDS in New York City, we could estimate this by race ethnicity. And here showing we were very surprised to see extremely high rates of HIV prevalence in New York City. 2.3% of Black males in the city were diagnosed and living with HIV, 1.6% of Hispanic males, 1.2% of Black females, 1.1% of white males. So, so all of a sudden we get a much bigger, a much clearer picture of what the HIV epidemic looks like in New York City through the expansion of this um, surveillance system. And this is a slide that was put together by our commissioner at the time, Tom Frieden, which basically compared what was going on in New York City to the rest of the United States. So we estimated that in the U.S., one in every 250 people were HIV positive compared to one in every 70 people in New York City. And then breaking it down in other different ways, one in 40 African-Americans in New York City, one in 10 or 10 percent of men who have sex with men, one in eight injecting drug users, one in five black men aged 40 to 49 in Manhattan, which is just staggering, 20%, and 25% of men who have sex with men in Chelsea. So the, the new surveillance system really opened up a lot of opportunity to gain insight and then respond to you know, what, what was a very extensive HIV epidemic in, in some communities and populations around the city. So I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. That was the year 2001, 2002, and, and a little bit after that. But but I'm just going to fast forward now to, to just highlight uh, so some highlights about what the recent HIV surveillance data for New York City are showing. The latest report goes through December 2018, the end of 2018. And through surveillance, they have now identified about 127,000 people diagnosed with HIV and living in, with HIV in New York City. This is an aging group of people, although there are new HIV infections among younger people, but about uh, close to 80% of people living with HIV in New York are 40 years or older, and 60% are 50 years or older. The majority are men, but about 26% are women and 1.5% are transgender. 76% are Black or Hispanic, 42% are men who have sex with men, and about 13% of those living with HIV report a history of, of injection drug use. And then, so, so that's all people diagnosed and living with HIV in New York City. And if we then look at those who are newly diagnosed with HIV in 2018, it gives you, it gets you a little bit closer to like what, what, who is being affected and acquiring HIV more recently. So there were about 2,000 or 1,900 new diagnoses of HIV in 2018. Importantly, 19% of them were, were concurrent HIV and AIDS diagnoses. So, so about 20% of people diagnosed with HIV in New York City had probably ha had HIV infection for, you know, eight, nine, 10 years prior to this. So, so, so still there's a lot of people with longstanding HIV infection who, who just aren't diagnosed until the time that they present with symptoms. And these are major missed opportunities for, you know, saving life with, with available treatments as well as preventing onward spread. And one sort of persistent theme here is that MSM minorities, minority women and young persons do continue to be heavily affected by HIV uh, AIDS in New York City with some, some of the breakdowns here. Importantly, it's really hard to get good information on risk factors. So while we can say that 54% of newly diagnosed males were among um, men who have sex with men, risk information is still missing for about 23% of people. 
vast majority of new HIV diagnoses in 2018 were among Black and Hispanic New Yorkers. And, and still, and looking at the younger age group, about 39% of the new diagnoses were among people aged 13 to 29. So this is not just uh, something that is affecting older people. It's still something that affects younger people in New York City. And this is a, a set of maps that's included in every annual report that the city health department puts out. So it shows the map of poverty. This this doesn't this is not an HIV related map here on the top left, but it shows the the map of poverty by New York City neighborhood, and then it shows how how HIV diagnosis rates vary by neighborhood in New York City. And of course, you can see the the overlap between uh, p- poverty and HIV, new HIV diagnoses in New York City. This map shows the prevalence of HIV. So those neighborhoods that have the highest uh, number of people diagnosed and living with HIV. And this last map on the bottom right shows the age adjusted death rate by neighborhood. Importantly, this is an era where, and this is a city where HIV drugs are widely available or should be for free to anyone who needs it. There are all kinds of systems in place to help make treatment available to those who need it and who, who are diagnosed with HIV. So in a, in a perfect world where everything was working the way it should, we should not see any differences in the death rate among people with HIV by neighborhood. Um, this is using people with HIV as the denominator. It really should be, you know, one color across here, and it should be very low, given how effective treatment is. But in fact, what we see is that you know it can vary by as much as 15 or 20 fold from one neighborhood to the next. Another thing that is really um, important to look at is this is not just related to the, the prevalence of HIV, like where there are more people with HIV, there are higher death rates. In some instances, that's, that's how it works. But let's take a look at the high HIV prevalence in Lower Manhattan here, Um, this area of the city has among the highest HIV prevalences in the city, but they have among the lowest death rates. And so this this suggests that there are some major differences and inequities in access to care by New York City neighborhoods. And also, you know, just flipping back up to the to the map of poverty, you know, this is also a part of the city that is not as affected by poverty, but is affected by HIV. But some of the er- other areas that are, are greatly affected by both also tend to have high, higher death rates. So we have major access to care uh, and services issues in the city that, that still need to be dealt with as it relates to HIV and, and, many, other, uh, and, and many other health outcomes. One of the things that I like in this report that the city health department puts out, the surveillance report, is they have these spark lines in here that just sort of give you a sense of what the trend looks like in different groups over time from 2001 to 2018. So you can quickly glean from this chart that for the most part, new HIV diagnoses are declining in almost every group uh, since 2001. You do see some some different trajectories in, in different groups though. And this is the chart related to perinatal HIV transmission in in New York City. It shows the number of children who are born to HIV infected women each year. And in in red, what we're seeing is the outcome of when the child became infected. And in blue is the outcome that we're hoping to achieve is, which is when the child is is not infected. And looking out to recent years here, well, first you're seeing fewer and fewer numbers of children born to women living with HIV, and also much more in the way of you know blue here, including zero cases in some years and very handful of cases since 2012. So th- this is uh, that that major national success story I highlighted earlier about reductions in perinatal HIV transmission, New York City is certainly doing really well um, in this regard. This happens because it's, it's increasingly possible to diagnose most women who are pregnant with HIV through antenatal care testing programs that are, are happening all across the state. When women with HIV are, are pregnant women with HIV are identified, they can start treatment and that reduces the greatly reduces the risk 
of transmission from mother to child and also cesarean section further reduces that risk. And so, so these numbers reflect the, the important process of rec recognizing pregnant women with HIV infection, treating them, and also cesarean delivery. So th this is just a, a graph that sort of shows the history of the entire epidemic in New York City of HIV and the added information that sort of came when the surveillance system expanded to include HIV non-AIDS. And so this is sort of completing the epidemiological picture here. And you know, now we can track the number of people living with HIV, all of them, not just those that, that have gone on to develop AIDS and also new HIV diagnoses alongside AIDS diagnoses and the, the, the curve here showing the trend in the death rate. Importantly, like we saw nationally, major declines in HIV in deaths among people with HIV, but it's still been kind of slow going and, uh, and still not you know, as low as it could be given how effective the treatments are. And this, this reflects this implementation issue, this, this, this access to care issue uh, that, that is a very important area of, of work to, to really help our uh, city benefit as much as we can from all of the treatments and technologies that are available. So I hope I've kind of conveyed here that, you know, we've been able to measure a lot of things about the HIV epidemic. We, we've looked at the incidence and prevalence of AIDS. You know, when treatment came along, tracking AIDS cases only is, is not really indicative of what was going on with HIV transmission, you know, years earlier. It was then beginning to reflect that plus a mix of, you know, who was accessing treatment and when. And so we, we've since evolved surveillance in New York City and also almost everywhere around the country to be able to track not just AIDS, but HIV. And we've shown how it's possible by understanding what proportion of people with HIV are undiagnosed. We can look at, we can estimate the overall pre prevalence of HIV, not just those that are diagnosed. And we've also looked at the epidemiology of HIV diagnoses, new HIV diagnoses. What, what we haven't talked about is the incidence of new infection. So true incidence, the number of people diagnosed in a given year, I mentioned it, it's really, it's a mix of people who may have been recently infected, as well as uh, those who have been infected sometime in the past, maybe, maybe years ago. And so it's important to know who's getting infected with HIV today when starting to plan for HIV prevention activities and you know, wanting to know who to target for HIV prevention and where. And so this was an active area in, in around the time that New York City was implementing its new HIV surveillance system, which really was about you know, what we wanna to do to control HIV is to reduce the number of new infections each year. For us to do that and for us to know if we're doing that successfully, we need to be able to measure new HIV infections. And this is a, this is a tricky thing to, to do. And there have been many approaches to trying to estimate HIV infection over the years. You know, you can, you can do it with cohorts, but cohorts are not necessarily representative of the general population. You really need population-based estimates of HIV incidence. There have been a couple of like laboratory-based strategies to sort of infer HIV incidence estimates, but most recently CDC has moved into a system that is sort of a modeling-based system that leverages population-based surveillance data. And the fact that people are, that, that surveillance captures information on CD4 counts. If you remember back to that graph I showed you at, at how after HIV infection, an untreated HIV infection, the CD4 count progressively declines over a period of years. And something that's implied there is that if you know someone's CD4 count, with someone who has HIV and their CD4 count, you, you can, on average, have a sense of like how long they've been living with HIV. So for example, someone with a CD4 count, a very low CD4 count of 100 or 50, it's likely that they've been living with HIV for on average, you know, maybe eight, nine, 10 years. And people with very high CD4 counts have been living with HIV for less time. And the CDC and others have developed a something called a CD4 depletion model where they use those CD4 count 
of values reported to surveillance to, uh, to sort of calculate and estimate what the HIV incidence was, as well as HIV prevalence and, is, and, and the percentage of undiagnosed HIV infection. It's a very interesting and elegant model, and I, I'm not going to present the details of, of the model that they used here, but I do, you do have the, the uh, publication here if you want to learn more about how it's done. But through, through this modeling approach, it's possible to, for, for CDC to use population-based surveillance data and the CD4 counts that come with it to come up with estimates of true HIV incidence, the number of people newly infected with HIV in a given calendar year. And with their model, what they've, they've done and, and shown here is that since 2010, they estimated that it was about 40,000 new infections e each year in the U.S. And it's it's pretty much marine level and maybe started to trend downward a little bit, although the precision of, of these incidence estimates appear to be worsening. But for the first time, CDC now has been producing pretty uh, reliable incidence estimates for each calendar year over time, and, and they're more recent. So here we have data going through 2018. They've been able to stratify this, this information by some of the same variables that we looked at with HIV diagnoses. And we're seeing some of the same trends here, right? New HIV infections, how they vary by sex, how they vary by age, how they are varying by race, ethnicity, Really not much in the way of change happening here, uh, except in some groups that may be even on the rise, like Hispanic and Latinos. And it's also, you know, possible to, to point out the very, you know, stark disparities by race, ethnicity that we're seeing in the HIV incidence estimates for the U.S. For example, Blacks and African Americans make up 12% of the U.S. population but 42% of new HIV infections in 2018. Hispanics and Latinos, 17% of the population in the U.S., 28% of the uh, new HIV infections. And um, comparing also this to whites, you see that while whites make up 62% of the population, they make up only 25% of new HIV diagnoses. And this last slide shows trends in the incidence over time by risk transmission category, again, showing what we saw with new HIV diagnoses, um, with MSM contact being the most common transmission category, followed by heterosexual contact and injecting drug use. So basically, the, uh, the HIV surveillance system with incidence added to it using the modeling approach really just really conveys what a comprehensive view of the U.S. epidemic we, we now have. We can track new diagnoses. We can track prevalence of diagnosed HIV. We can use that to estimate the overall prevalence of HIV, including the prevalence of undiagnosed HIV. We can track deaths over time, both to all cause deaths and other causes like such as HIV specific deaths or or other related deaths um, among people with HIV and we can track the number of new infections over time now true incidence all this is just to say that you know in the in the area of HIV and our understanding of HIV infection in the US we have an incredible epidemiological capacity to monitor key aspects of the epidemic using population based data I can, can think of very few other public health threats and infectious diseases that we can characterize this well. And we also have, in addition to the population-based data that um, come from health departments and other sources, we have non-population-based research data uh, that really add depth, tons of, of, of research studies that add depth on behaviors or the efficacy of different strategies and interventions and, and, and so forth. So we really are fortunate to, to have a lot of intelligence and information on the epidemiology of HIV and how to control it. I alluded to this earlier about how HIV treatment, in addition to helping the individual who has HIV and prolonging their life, their life expectancy, it's also was thought theoretically possible that 
treatment of HIV could reduce the risk of individuals with HIV uh, spreading spreading it to others, um, such as sex and needle sharing partners. And there was a, a, a landmark study in the New England Journal um, around 2011, which was the H- HIV Prevention Trials Network, HPTN, Protocol 052, which randomized, um, it enrolled serodiscordant couples, so one person with HIV, one person without, and and it treated, it randomized half of the couples uh, and treated the HIV patient as as usual according to clinical protocols versus earlier than usual. So that was the sort of difference, early treatment with HIV versus treatment as usual. And what they saw was that the transmission rate in the serodiscordant couples in the group of people with HIV that were randomized to early treatment, the, the transmission rate was reduced by 96%. And this was very rigorous randomized trial evidence that, that treatment for HIV was also very effective at preventing HIV transmission. And it ushered in what is called the, you know, the treatment as prevention era for HIV. And, and this has been a cornerstone of the response to HIV, the HIV epidemic um, in the U.S. and the pandemic globally. So treating HIV helps uh, improves the health of the person with the HIV, and it also it has a public health benefit of reducing transmission. Another huge development is the development of something called PrEP or, or pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is a pill, a daily pill or an on-demand pill that um, someone who is at risk for HIV infection can take to prevent the acquisition of HIV. And uh, this is showing, this is a slide that is showing the results of another really important trial that showed the, um, th- that, that showed the, uh, the efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis at preventing HIV to be very, very high. So it's another very effective tool that we have for HIV prevention as well, as well as the very effective treatment. And so we have, you know, we have tools to substantially reduce HIV acquisition, and that would be PrEP. And we have tools to substantially reduce deaths among people with HIV that are very effective, namely treatment, and also effective at preventing onward transmission, right? 96% reduction in onward transmission um, among people who start treatment early. But there are major, major implementation gaps. So it's one thing to have really effective tools on hand. It's another thing to get them to everyone who needs them at the scale that is needed. So we're in this situation where we have all kinds of great evidence-based strategies for HIV prevention and treatment. And and, and we, we, we are at the place, and this is the, the field of implementation science of HIV is really focused on how do we bridge this gap between the efficacy, the high levels of efficacy that, that randomized controlled trials promise and uh, the effectiveness that we want to see in the real world when these interventions, when we attempt to take these interventions to scale. So just to give you an idea of what we are talking about here, I mentioned, I think there were, we covered that there were about 1.1 million people living with HIV in the U.S. So to maximize the the impact of treatment, we want to get as many people, as close to 100% of people with HIV on treatment and with, with suppressed viral load on treatment early. But what we actually see when we look across the entire U.S. of those 1.1 million or so people estimated to be living with HIV, only about 86% of them have been diagnosed. So that's the first step where we have a gap. And then there's getting people from the point of being diagnosed to actually engaged in medical care, to begin to receive care, and then to be retained in care over time, and ultimately to the point of viral suppression. And if you look at these these estimates um, across the U.S., what we're seeing is only about 56% of people living with HIV have gotten to this point of viral suppression, which can in, improve their their life expectancy as well as reduce the, the likelihood of onward transmission. And so this is why these gaps, these are the reasons why we're seeing continued 
new infections of, due to a, new, new HIV infection and also a, a continued trend in a substantial number of deaths due to, due to HIV every year in the U.S. There have been a number of attempts to sort of move to sort of the next level of implementation, including a, a national HIV AIDS strategy. The first ever was launched by the Obama administration in 2010 and then updated in 2015, which really called on focusing on, on some of these gaps, improving HIV testing, linking people to care, and improving access to treatment. And, and trying to achieve universal HIV viral suppression among uh, people living with HIV for the reasons we've discussed, as well as expanding access to the pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP services that we know are very effective at preventing HIV acquisition. Just to compare this, New York City is doing considerably better than the, the nation as a whole, but there are still you know, many, uh, many gaps that remain here as well. So of the um, 100%, if, if we're looking at the full denominator of people living with HIV here, you can see there's still about 7% who are not yet diagnosed and a lower proportion that have received care or have been prescribed drugs. And only 77% of people with HIV in New York City are have, have sort of gotten stable on treatment so that they are no longer that they, that they no longer are transmissible uh, their HIV is no longer transmissible to to others this is a graph that shows HIV incidence estimates for New York State over time and you can see that while there has been progress at um, reducing the number of new HIV infections, they're, they've kind of leveled off. Uh, this is some, some earlier data showing what was happening between 2010 and 2014. And this prompted our, our then governor, Andrew Cuomo, to, to launch an ending the AIDS epidemic in New York initiative or an ETE initiative. This is an initiative that has since been launched in many other jurisdictions around the U.S. and around the world. New York was one of the first and it set out with a with an ambitious goal. Well, I mean, I, I, I'd say it set out with a, with a, with a goal that um, maybe could have been even more ambitious than it was, but to reduce the number of new infections from about 3,000 to about 750 per year by the end of 2020. And you can see the focus points here. It really is on some of these these implementation gaps. Getting people who have HIV who are not diagnosed, tested, and linked to healthcare, and treat people with, with drugs, HIV drugs, as soon as possible to keep them healthy and to prevent onward transmission, and also scale up access to, to PrEP. As part of that initiative, the the blueprint that came from that task force that the governor had convened on to, to identify ways to to the, the strategies to end the HIV epidemic in New York. One of them was was related to surveillance and included the creation of a, a dissemination system that was web based and public facing so that people could see the progress of this initiative towards achieving its its goals. This is a this is a dashboard system that actually our team at CUNY was was chosen to to develop and run for for the initiative. And I just wanted to give you show you a few screenshots of, of it here, but its purpose is to to measure and track this progress that that the uh, state is making on achieving its goals of ending the HIV epidemic in New York. And we we developed a bunch of metrics that are aligned with the the goals of the initiative. But we wanted to create a um, way of visually interacting with some of the data, the surveillance data and other data that were relevant to, to this, this initiative. And the system has been live for a few years now. You can check it out at ete-dashboardny.org to get a sense of what's going on with uh, trends in HIV-related outcomes, PrEP use over time. If you, if you go there, you will see a bunch of different metrics that are part of this initiative and, and how those metrics are doing. For example, this is incidents in New York City going from about 2,700 new infections in 2014 down to close to 1,500 
in in 2018 and this is the target so you can get a sense of, of what the trend looks like in relation to what the goals um, of the initiative are um, these are the kinds of metrics you can you can check out on the website since then the, there has been a national ending the epidemic initiative called ending called ehe ending the hiv epidemic and they have also created a dashboard system that you can check out that will show you what's going on around a number of HIV-related indicators in different key jurisdictions around the U.S. And you can find that by, by Googling ahead, ending the HIV epidemic, or going to HIV.gov. So that wraps up the section on HIV in the U.S. And I just want to close by covering a little bit of a little bit about HIV globally and in resource limited settings, because it's a very different environment, of course, and there's a lot more HIV in resource limited settings than we have in the U.S. So just to give you a sense of how it fits in, we talked about about how how there were about 1.1 million people living with HIV around the U.S. Well, globally, it, it's about 38 million. So you can get a sense of the um, fraction of of all HIV prevalence that is made up by, by people living in the U.S. with HIV. Most of the HIV infection is concentrated in the sub-Saharan African region here among 38 million people with HIV globally. And in this region, you can have very high uh, population level prevalence. I think we were seeing prevalence rates of less than 1% in the U.S., but in some settings in sub-Saharan Africa, you can see prevalence rates um, well above 1% in, in at least eight countries, um, higher than 10% in the population. So just to give you guys a sense of where this fits in globally, you recall from the Global Burden of Disease Project, the visualizations that uh, show the distribution of deaths according to cause, and the red ones here are the infectious causes of death globally. And you can see where HIV fits in. And if you look at the other metrics, such as years of life lost, you can see that the share of deaths that infectious disease takes up, or years of life lost in this case, increases, as well as the, the role of HIV in driving the burden. This shows the ranking in the cause of death in 1990 compared to 2019, and you can see that you know HIV/AIDS was number 30 in terms of the cause of death globally, and over the course of these you know 29 years, has risen to number 11 globally. It was it wasn't until about 2003, some you know seven or eight years after highly effective treatment became widely available in resource-rich settings, that the global community began to mobilize around the idea of, of providing HIV treatment in areas of the world that were really hardest hit by the epidemic. And there were really three major initiatives that were sort of moving, moving the field forward. It was a global fund for AIDS to be in malaria, the World Health Organization's 3 by 5 initiative, and the U.S.-based unilateral effort called PEPFAR, or the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, this is the largest of all of the efforts, initially focused on about 15 countries, most in sub-Saharan Africa, but provided uh, tens of billions of dollars over subsequent years, aiming to increase the number of people on HIV treatment in the hardest hit areas of the world, as well as several other important goals. How would this work uh, was that, that you know, the money would be provided to implementing partners and national programs to work together in country under the, under the direction of the national HIV care and treatment programs and their guidelines within the larger health system in each country, usually within the public health and within the public sector uh, s s clinics and, and service delivery settings. The care is provided by local health care providers, but the implementing partners who might be from the U.S. or Europe or other resource-rich settings that were involved in, in providing the technical assistance would, would work with in-country partners on training and mentoring and capacity building, drug delivery and increasing and improving the laboratory infrastructure and, and just general technical assistance around uh, service delivery of HIV HIV-related services, working in direct partnership with national programs.
but you can get a sense of what the, the challenge looks like in many resource limited settings in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in many settings, the, the healthcare system really was in crisis due to years of, of neglect and under-resourced approaches to providing healthcare and overcrowding. And so this made it very challenging to, to, to begin to advance a very large scale initiative to deliver drugs and other and testing and, and uh, diagnostics and care services to millions of people. But it nonetheless was the setting that, 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 that was, that, that everyone had to work with when this, these initiatives began. But these, these challenges included, you know, a limited prevention armamentarium. Of course, treatment is, you want it to be your last resort. Ideally, you would be pre- preventing infections so that you didn't have to uh, treat them over the course of someone's lifetime. There was also very high rates of both late diagnosis and late treatment initiation, ma- making the, the cases more complicated to manage clinically and also increasing the mortality rates following treatment initiation several other challenges including you know sometimes on again off again commitment from international donors because of political issues or because of you know global financial trends and this makes it very hard for ministries of health and other national um, entities to to plan what needed to be you know really uh, programs that that need to last decades just to throw up on the timeline here to, to give you a sense of, you know, we, we really began, got highly effective treatments for HIV in 1995, but it really wasn't until 2005 that the world really turns its, turns its attention to HIV in resource limited settings and treatment. And this was a time when there were about 38, 31 million people living with HIV around the world, but only 4% of them were on treatment. This was really something that was limited to resource-rich settings. Uh, and and the, the, uh, the, the goal of some of these initiatives to provide treatment in resource-limited settings beginning in 2004 and 2005 really was a, a large-scale initiative, unprecedented in many ways uh, on the scale of, of, from a public health initiative on the scale of the smallpox eradication campaign that we heard about a few weeks ago. What did this look like? Again, you know, going back to 2005, um, of the 28 million people living with HIV in 2005, only 2.2 million of them were on treatment. But rapidly, with this influx of resources and international commitment to to working with resource limited settings hardest hit by HIV, you begin to see really massive increases, millions of people placed on life saving treatment over the course of, you know, about 10 or 15 years, such that by 2018, there were there, there were 23 million people on life saving HIV treatments, but still with a, a major amount of, of room to improve. This is a schematic that just shows the uh, similar concept of the the implementation gap that we saw in the U.S. And you can see globally about 79% of people living with HIV are aware of their status. And of those, about 78% are on HIV treatment. And of those, about 86% have sort of achieved this treatment goal of being virally suppressed such that their, their, their life their life expectancy will improve and they will be less likely to transmit HIV to others in their lives. But this amounts to about 53% of all people living with HIV having achieved viral suppression. What do the trends look like globally? This is showing the, the trend in new HIV infections on the top, so HIV incidence and the trends in AIDS related deaths over time. You can see that Globally, we peaked at about 2.5 million infections every year around the world. And by, two point, uh, by um, 2019, we were at about 1.7 million um, new infections per year. And in terms of deaths, we were between 1.5 and 2 million deaths a year. And you know, major progress with, with increasing access to, to treatment around the world. Now about 690,000 deaths every year. You, these dots represent the, the targets that have been set globally, and you can see we're very far off on the incidence target here, but we are close to achieving the 2020 targets. They won't be achieved, but we're at least closer. And this reflects 
our success at getting large number of people, large numbers of people onto HIV treatment, and our, our success to a much lesser extent on HIV prevention. So you can see the progress here. This is the same ranking chart um, that I showed before, except this time instead of 1990, I'm showing you 2004. And you can see that the HIV AIDS as a number six cause of death globally has moved now to number 11. And if you focus this, if you, if you just redo the same chart for Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see how um, in terms of the number of DALIs, HIV AIDS went from number one to number five over the course of about 15 years. And this is real progress as a result of the, the world's effort and the world's focus on the hardest hit areas uh, of the world when it comes to the HIV pandemic uh, with resources and, uh, and services and, and drugs. And I'll just leave you with this. Next week, we'll be focusing on um, TB and malaria, other you know, major leading causes of infectious disease uh, deaths in, in sub-Saharan Africa and around the world. I hope you all have a great and safe week ahead, and I look forward to seeing you all soon.